I am Puerto Rican, and I live in Brooklyn. But when I was young, I often spent summers in my grandmother's house in Yauco, Puerto Rico. She had a lot of land deep in the mountains, so deep that roads would go off into the wilderness through narrow mountain passes where cliffs were just a few inches off the tire driving in pitch black. If a car came in the opposite direction, either they or you would have to drive in reverse until you found a place to pass each other. It was scary. The property has been with my family for a long time, and my family has been in Yauco as far back as anyone can recall. I used to spend a lot of time with my great-grandfather, Papito, who farmed the land and took care of some cows. He was very old, and he was nearly 100% Taino indigenous Puerto Rican. From him, I would hear stories about the Indios who lived in the wilderness when he was young, who were not culturally assimilated into colonial society after hundreds of years of Spanish occupation. My family would often hide and harbor the culturally wild Puerto Ricans, culturally indigenous, because if Spanish locals found them, Los Matan, they would kill them. I had my first brush with mortality there at age six or so, crushing the jelly bean sized eggs of salamanders I found in the brush and watching the pink underdeveloped hatchling run for cover on instinct. My grandmother told me that what I had done was very wrong and I instantly knew why. I was filled with cold shame and I cried. Papito told me about strange flying disks he would see coming to the mountains and submerging into the lake. He told me about the spirits in the valley, that you could hear them, and to be careful walking around the roads of the mountains at night on my way home from his house to my grandmother's. He taught me how to control a bull with its horns and how to ride it. He did a whistle only he could do when he wanted to gain the attention of an animal on the mountain that made them either follow him go where he directed them, or just settle down. He told me about the legend of Diego Salcedo, which took place there in Yauco. When he was almost 100, Papito was dying, and all of our family came to see him. He was a link to an old time, and so many people in Yauco knew him. They all went to his house. Uncles, aunts, cousins, people from nearby, all gathered at his house on the top of the hill. I was too young to be present for his passing. I sort of didn't understand what was going on at the time. I was sent down to my grandmother's house to wait for the proceedings to be over. The sun was going down. The mountains were like shadows rising around me. Walking alone, I started to hear animals all about, crying out. Wild dogs all over the mountains. Chickens were making a ruckus. The pigs in the lower valley were screaming almost like humans. The cows were howling in a way that I can only describe as similar to Cat Stark from Game of Thrones when Rob died. Every single non-human thing in the mountain with an earshot was wailing in a fashion that I've never heard before or since. As a little kid, you can imagine how frightening that was, especially because I was all alone. I hid in the house, looking out the window, waiting for my grandmother and listening to the animals cry. I was especially sensitive to sound then, as it had been a time in my life where I was often sick and constantly on the medication amoxicillin, which I was allergic to. It created this sort of overwhelming extrasensory sound experience. At some point, all the animals stopped making noise and I was thankful. Before bed, I asked my grandmother what had happened, why all of the animals were making that sound. She told me that Papito had just died and that all of the animals on the mountain had realized the powerful being that protected it for so long was gone, that they had seen his spirit pass and it was sensible that this change would affect them very deeply. My grandmother's perspective was that the animals just know these things. I couldn't sleep. I went outside, late at night, curious and scared out of my wits, thinking about the spirits that may be out in the darkness of the mountain wilderness, thinking about that terrible, painful lamentation that was embodied by animals crying like people. 
I went close to the edge of one of the small nearby cliffs that hung over the endless darkness. I squatted and listened. I heard a sound that scared me, a feral cry in the darkness. I don't know what dog it was or if it was a dog at all, but it was certainly too close and I was by myself. It howled and yelped and I regretted coming outside. I was sort of frozen there, afraid to move, but afraid to stay. I wouldn't dare call out for my grandmother. I would be scolded for coming out and wandering around at night. She probably wouldn't hear me anyway. A moment later, I heard that whistle that Papito used to do, out in the darkness. The howling stopped. As a child, I didn't think, that couldn't be Papito, he's dead like any adult in their right mind would think. I just thought, it's Papito. It had to be. No one else could do that. No one knew how to whistle that way in my family, and it was only us for miles around on the mountain. Where the sound came from would have been impossible for any person to be. Not even during the daytime could they be there. It was deep inside of the wilderness on the severe cliffside, but I knew he was there just the same. I'm sure that at that age, the line between life and death was blurred. Yauco is the area where the chief of Taino lived. It is also where the rebellion began against the Spanish, with the drowning of the conquistador Diego Salcedo. Many of the surviving Taino escaped into the mountains of Yauco and lived in secrecy there for a long time, hiding their lifestyle behind some of the more assimilated natives, like Papito. They say the Taino are extinct, but that cannot be. I knew some of them, and I am one too, if only a little bit. When I was little, maybe around seven or so, I had my first paranormal experience. My mom always told me that she felt like I attracted things from the spiritual realm, even as a baby. But this experience is the first one that is my own memory, and I remember it vividly, now at 26 years old. My mom was unlucky enough to have not only my father die, but also my little sister's father. My dad passed away due to a car accident and my sister's dad had committed suicide after a battle with severe depression. Needless to say, my mom had it pretty rough, and being a single working mother, she would often take us to a family friend who babysat us while she worked late nights at the hospital. The woman who babysat us was a warm, kind, and gentle woman named Rhonda. She always took the best care of us, and my sister and I really enjoyed staying with her. Rhonda had two birds who we loved to talk to. They would repeat simple things like, hello and what's up? We thought it was the coolest thing. After a long day of playing, my sister and I were off to bed and Rhonda tucked me into bed in her spare room downstairs. My sister was still pretty little and she slept in the same room as Rhonda because she was too scared to sleep alone. And Rhonda was like a grandma to us who was more than happy to share her bed if we got scared. I was a big girl and I loved having my own room to sleep in. I was never scared. On this night though, I was having trouble falling asleep and I just kept tossing and turning, growing frustrated that I wasn't asleep. And for some reason, I began to get anxiety and become fearful. I didn't know why I was scared but I was. After what felt like forever of me just laying there, contemplating getting up and crawling into Rhonda's bed, I heard something in a low, calm male voice say, Marissa, it's okay, just go to sleep. This surprised me, but it didn't scare me. I believe that as a child, you're more open and susceptible to paranormal things due to the fact that you're not conditioned to be fearful yet. With age, you learn what's scary and all the things that go bump in the night that you should run away from. 
But I was still so innocent that I didn't register this as threatening at all. Actually, it calmed me down and I started to feel very tired and I just accepted what the voice told me and went to sleep. The next morning, Rhonda made us breakfast as she always did. She sat across from me and sipped her coffee. I always asked her for a sip of it because if I wasn't already a strange child, I also had a taste for coffee. She asked me how I slept and I told her that I was scared but that somebody had told me to go to sleep. She looked at me confused and she asked me if I had had a dream that somebody was talking to me. But I told her, no, I was awake. She said it was probably the birds talking again and I told her I was sure that it wasn't. She then asked me if it was a man's voice or a woman's voice. And when I instantly said it was a man's voice, her face changed from the usual cheery, warm expression to put off and uncomfortable. I had never seen her face look like that before, and I think that's why I remember this so vividly. She very quickly changed the subject and we went about our day, and I didn't think about that again for years. Fast forward into my teens, my mom and I were having a discussion about the paranormal because I had had a lot of strange activity happening. She asked me what the very first experience I remember was that I thought was paranormal. I shared the story about the man's voice at Rhonda's house and how odd Rhonda's reaction had been. My mom looked at me and her eyes widened a bit. Rhonda had gone MIA a few years later and unfortunately she just slowly lost contact with us. Eventually she was no longer a part of our lives. I hadn't seen her in years. When my mom collected her thoughts, she looked at me and said, Marissa, you know Rhonda's son died in that room, right? I did not. I knew she had had a son who'd passed away of a tragic overdose, but I was so young that I had never met him. So I didn't really think anything about it. I looked back at my mom and we just didn't have anything to say. We were both thinking the same thing. If I was hearing a spirit speak to me, there's a good chance it could have been her son. From what my mom said about him, he was very kind and caring, much like his mom. Maybe that's why I wasn't afraid when he, if he, spoke to me. I'm not saying this is factually what happened, but it does make me wonder. The voice I heard was real, that much I do know. Regardless of who it belonged to, it's sure to me that that much is true. Since that experience, I've had many more, and unfortunately, they got much more sinister as I got older. It got very, very dark for a while, and I witnessed things that you usually only see in horror movies. I still think of this experience often, and hopefully you enjoyed it. Regardless, it's not something I'm likely to forget anytime soon. So my dad used to work at this restaurant that was extremely haunted. The building was very old, built sometime in the mid 1800s, and there were records of at least a few deaths happening on the premises back when it used to be a boarding house. Staff used to complain about cold spots, weird smells, and sometimes something would push by them when there was no one around. But there are two first-hand accounts from my family directly. The first story is my mom's. Well, technically I was there too, but I don't remember it because I was only two years old at the time. It was my dad's turn to open up the restaurant that day, and she had gone with my father to spend some extra time with him while he did prep work. She went to the bathroom and took me with her. As she was washing her hands, she heard three knocks on the bathroom door, evenly spaced. She thought that my dad was playing a joke on her. So she whispered to me, your father has no rhythm, and knocked back in a fun pattern, a rap tap tap kind of a thing. She expected my dad to crack a joke or knock back in a playful way. But instead, 
The reply was three evenly spaced knocks. After she left the washroom, she saw my dad coming down from the second floor of the restaurant. Very funny, honey, she said. My dad was very confused. He had no idea what she was talking about. To this day, he says that he did not knock on the bathroom door. The restaurant was locked. You don't want customers wandering in before you're open, after all. My parents and I were the only people there. That's the first story. The second is mine. But before I tell it, I'd like to go on a brief tangent and describe the restaurant a little bit better to give you a better feel for the overall vibe. In general, the interior was always pretty dark. The only windows in the place were at the front of the building, facing the street. And that natural light didn't do much because the building was very long. The back of the restaurant, near the kitchens, was the darkest place in the whole building. But it always felt the coziest to me. No, the worst area was, paradoxically, the brightest. There was a patio attached to the second floor with an adjoining sunroom, the worst room in the whole building. The rest of the restaurant was very cramped, very dim, very Dickensian. Good old Victorian architectural design. The sunroom, in contrast, was very open, very light, and it had a lovely view of the patio and the pretty flower boxes we had out there. And I hated it. Standing in that big empty room, you could just feel all of the space behind you. And you always had this unsettling thought that something was watching you. I used to hug the walls a little whenever I was in there because that way nothing could stand behind me. I mention this because my story happens on the second floor. There was going to be a fundraising event on the second floor and I got recruited to help out. My mom had me running around, putting up decorations, cleaning the works. Normally, I was scared to be on the second floor at all, but it wasn't so bad because I was with other people and I had a job to distract myself with. It was actually the first time that I had ever been up there and had fun. That didn't last long though. The first strange thing that happened was a painting went flying off the wall. And I do mean flying. It didn't just fall. It went a good few feet horizontally. Of course, this was spooky, but we all just rationalized it, put the painting back on the wall and kept working because people were going to start arriving in a few hours. Once the event got started, that was when the real trouble began. One of our friends, Sally, went into the second floor bathroom. When she tried to leave, the door wouldn't open, even though it wasn't locked. At this point, she got a bit nervous and knocked on the door, hoping that someone on the other side could help her get it open. And that set something off because suddenly the entire bathroom erupted into loud banging. It was a commotion. People outside heard, including me, and we all gathered around the bathroom door to try and get her out of there. We had her lock and then unlock the door. We jiggled the doorknob. We even tried forcing it open. Nothing worked. Inside, what was muffled banging to us sounded deafeningly loud to Sally. It really freaked her out. We were only able to get the door open once the mysterious noise had stopped. Weirdly, we had never had any issue with that door sticking before, and I don't think we had one after. Sally put on a brave face, but it was clear that she was pretty rattled. In private, she later confided that it was one of the most frightening things that had ever happened to her. Later on, after all the guests had left, I was helping clean up. We had a small stand of necklaces for sale set up on the minibar. A pendant in the middle started swaying forwards and backwards, like someone had flicked it with their finger. The rest of the necklaces were perfectly still. My mom saw this too. We both looked at each other and quietly decided that it would be best to not make a fuss and to get out of there as quickly as possible. I think that night set a record for the most unexplained events that had happened in the entire restaurant at once. 
It closed down a few years later, was mostly torn down, and was rebuilt. I don't know if the new building is still haunted or not. Last October, my best friend, Tanner, died unexpectedly. I don't need to go into too many details because they're not relevant to the story, but it was easily one of the hardest hitting losses I've ever experienced. He and I shared a very close and special bond and had overcome a lot of life together. He had moved in with our mutual friend, Beth, and her boyfriend several months prior to passing away so I would constantly come over to hang out with everyone as I lived nearby. One summer day, we all had a giant Nerf gun fight together in their front yard. I distinctly remember making eye contact with Tanner and having this strange gut feeling at the time that this was going to be a bittersweet moment. But I brushed it off as just being sad that summer was coming to a close. I felt uneasy that he had at the same time a sad, longing look in his eyes that I did. It began to get dark out. After collecting as many darts as we could, we headed inside, and Tanner declared, this isn't over yet. A month later, after noticing many strange behaviors, Beth and her boyfriend made the heavy decision to call Tanner's mom and have her convince him to go back to rehab. Three months later, Tanner was dead. I have moved out of state since, but I always go back to visit Beth when I'm home. One day, after a heavy snowfall, I pulled into Beth's driveway. Just as I hopped out of my car, Beth came to the door to greet me. Something yellow popped out against the fresh snowfall, immediately catching both of our attention. We looked down and directly on her front step, perfectly placed in the untouched snow with no footsteps around was a nerf dart. Well played, buddy. Well played. I lived in an apartment in Hawaii where I had a lot of terrible nightmares. The layout of the apartment went like this. You stepped through the door into the foyer and immediately to your right was the kitchen. To your left was a shoe closet. There was a half counter separating the living room and dining room and to the left of the living room past the shoe closet was a T-shaped hall. The shorter hall was at the front and it led to two bedrooms, one at each end and the long hall that split this short hall went past a full-length mirror, washer and dryer, two sinks, and ended in the bathroom. This hallway consistently creeped me out. Noises, movements out of the corner of my eye, and a mounting sense of dread every time I stood in the hallway was already starting to manifest, along with a lot of other instances. In order to avoid being scared from my nightmares, I slowly start to become a night owl. This means sleeping all day and staying up all night. Well, one night, I decide to shower for whatever reason at a time between midnight and one in the morning, when everyone else in the household is asleep. I start doing my usual routine, starting with washing my hair, when I start to hear a faint noise that wasn't water hitting porcelain. It takes a moment to register what I was hearing. A woman screaming, absolute bloody murder. Anger and horror and anguish are obvious in her voice, but it was so faint I couldn't possibly fathom where it was coming from at first. I turned to look out the tiny window in the corner of the shower, the only form of ventilation in our bathroom, and I think that it can't possibly be coming from there. After all, I live on the 22nd floor. So I'm rinsing the shampoo out of my hair, dwelling on this screaming which is still going on, when I finally pinpoint it. It's coming from the drain, between my feet. Okay, I think, 
It's probably a neighbor watching TV, and the noise is just traveling through the pipes. No biggie. I'm fairly convinced of this now, and I'm on that train of thought, wondering who in the world is watching TV while in their bathroom, and wasn't doing that a dangerous thing. As I'm thinking along those lines, as if to retaliate my nonchalant brushing off, the screaming starts to get incrementally louder. Of course, I figure somebody's just slowly turning up their TV. It takes seconds to register that the screaming is turning to faint screaming and gargling. It's not a TV. It's literally in the pipes, and it's coming closer, starting to echo as it comes up the drain. Then this thought hits me. What will be here if and when it finally reaches the end of the drain? Fear suddenly washes over me, the sort of fear that led to me shutting the shower off, soap still half in my hair, falling out of the shower in a panic scramble, and backing away as the screaming continues. I don't bother with clothes or a towel. I leave all the lights on for my parents to scold me about in the morning. I didn't care. I ran through the hallway and into my room and locked the door. After that, I never showered again unless somebody was awake. From then on, that little window in the corner of the shower, I could feel someone staring in through it, constantly watching me. Every now and then, if I glanced up at it out of the corner of my eye, I could see the swish of long black hair disappearing out of sight. I hated that apartment and in some ways, I still do. This is a story that happened in Hawaii to my brother and his friend. We moved from Japan when I was barely a year old we spent some time in California, of which I can barely remember, then Louisiana, my dad's home state. But then by the time I was four, we had moved to Hawaii, on the island of Oahu to be specific. At first we lived on base housing, but my dad soon retired from active duty, and thus we were upended and forced to find new jobs and a house. We ended up in one of those single-story duplexes that shared a common wall. We lived in the back apartment, where we had our own patio and a huge garden in the back that our landlord's wife took care of. The landlord lived in the front portion with a garage and a patio. I never knew this little tidbit of information until after I moved out, but apparently her mother used to live in the section we lived in and had died there a very old and very happy woman. It was her garden, and she had loved it and taken care of it like a child. Thus, we were always told to treat the garden with respect, which my brother and I did without question. In this house, it was mostly very quiet. There were little things here and there that I can remember. Footsteps in the grass in the evenings, our dog barking for hours on end at something nobody could see in the backyard, a shadow of a little girl standing in the doorway to my brother and I's room, simply peeking in curiously. The only malicious and strange thing was the room that my brother and I shared, which was constantly, and I mean constantly, cold. It felt like there was an air conditioner on full blast in that room, but our house did not have an AC unit at all. Also, if my mom and I spent too much time in that room, we would get headaches that wouldn't leave until we left the house. But just because the house was odd didn't mean that it didn't spook the hell out of other people. Cue my brother's friend, Jay. As I knew Jay, he was a very open, friendly, fast-talking dude who loved to just be happy. I liked him a lot. Where my brother was smart-ass or introverted, Jay was outgoing and always willing to actually talk to me. A lot of the kids on my block were around my brother's age instead of mine, so I always tried to hang around him and his gang, which wasn't cool with him at all. Because A, I was the baby and couldn't keep up with the big boys, and B, it's not cool to let your sister tag along. It was always a boy's thing. 
But Jay never let any of those factors bother him and was always happy to hang out with me when the other guys wouldn't. So I knew him as a brother. Obviously, my brother had a lot of friends and we constantly had people over. This made my mom happy because she had always dreamed of having a lot of kids. So she sort of mothered and adopted each and every one of our friends. Our house sort of became the house everybody wanted to stay over at. So there was always somebody sleeping over well into our high school years. This story takes place while my brother and his friends were about 16 to 17. My brother had his first serious girlfriend and was constantly hanging out with her. When apart, calling her on the phone. Jay was staying the night. My brother was in the kitchen, which is mostly fenced in by walls and a half counter, talking to his girlfriend on the phone, while Jay was merely zoning out to music on the living room floor. All of a sudden, it gets cold. Not the whole room, either, but just a certain spot, to his side over an arm. Weirded out, he glances that way to see nothing. Then this spot starts moving, up his arm, over his neck, up to his mouth, and he describes it as the strangest sensation, like kissing a pair of frozen lips that aren't there. It's then he realizes something's not right, sits up, touches his lips, and looks around for whatever just kissed him. He finds nothing out of place, aside for a cold spot now a bit farther from him, close to where our couch was. He calls for my brother to come and check it out, as confirmation he's not imagining this cold thing. My brother comes around, still on the phone, and when he hovers his hand in that particular area, he seems pretty surprised to find it's remarkably cold. Now, here's where it gets really weird. At this point, Jay says my brother's face blanked out. His eyes glazed over, and he went limp so suddenly that he dropped the phone. John distinctly remembers hearing his girlfriend saying, Hello? Hello? Is anyone there? What's happening over there? Of course, my brother fell back onto the couch, and his lips were moving, but nothing really came out. Jay tries to snap my brother out of it, so he gets close and starts to shake him. That's when he can finally hear what my brother is saying. In a feminine voice that was definitely not my brother's, he was repeating, I'm sorry I did that. You just reminded me of someone I loved, over and over. When he gives him a particularly hard shake, my brother snaps out of it and seems relatively confused as to why he's on the couch and the phone is on the floor, why Jay looks so freaked out, and why the cold spot was no longer there. Anyway, my brother shrugged off the whole thing, laughed at Jay, called him a jokester, and quickly went back to talking with his girlfriend, with apologies and sweet nothings. Jay was shaken. He never spent the night at our house again after that. He said he felt like he was constantly being followed and watched in our house, and he always tried to make a point of not staying too long. This story happened to me about 12 years ago. I was 21 years old, just finished basic training for the Air Force, and I didn't have my tech school for another six months, so the Air Force sent me home. While home in Hawaii, my parents decided to take me to Vietnam to visit, as I'm Vietnamese and my mom felt it was important for me to visit the motherland. On the trip, it was my parents, my four-year-old brother, and my best friend Dan. For most of the trip, we did what normal tourists did. One of our destinations was the city of Kanto. It's a harbor city. Not thinking anything and never really believing in the supernatural, I was also excited to visit historical sites and stay at old hotels. We ended up staying at a hotel that was by a harbor. I don't remember the name of the hotel, but Dan and I shared a hotel room and my parents and little brother had the next room. I remember going to bed like it was any other ordinary day. 
I was dreaming, and I saw this figure laying on the bottom edge of my bed. This person was laid in the fetal position. For some reason, my eyes were focused on his feet, then started to slowly move up his body, and then I realized he was naked. Then I saw his face, and at that moment I made eye contact with him, and he stared back at me. Once that happened, I began to have sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I could hear myself screaming, but nothing was coming out. I kept screaming, Dan, Dan, but he could not hear me. So I told myself to calm down and try to burst out. And that's what I did. It worked. I jumped up and woke Dan up. The first thing my friend asked me was why I was so pale. It looked like I'd seen a ghost, he said. I told him what happened. It freaked him out and we ran to my mom's room and woke them up. My parents asked me what happened. As I was explaining to them what I had experienced, the curtains covering their window began to sway back and forth and the lights in the room started flickering like crazy. My dad, who's a total skeptic, yelled, leave my family alone. And it just stopped. After several minutes of talking and trying to understand what happened, we went to bed. Dan and I slept in their room on the extra bed. The next day we woke up and my parents were already downstairs eating breakfast. When I went downstairs, my mom greeted me and told me she had someone for me to talk to. It was the hotel manager. She had told him what had happened and he told me, yeah, it happens a lot to people who are in the military. I was confused and asked why. He said this hotel had been built on top of what used to be an American hospital during the Vietnam War. And he said that they were trying to reach out to their comrades. I became a believer in the supernatural then, and have been ever since. My grandmother, or tutu as we say in Hawaii, was the center of our entire family. She has always been the center of my life, and there's not a single day that goes by that I don't think of her, even 17 years after her death. She was of pure Hawaiian descent, and growing up with her as a child was supernatural in the biggest sense. I have many stories to share, all of them entirely true, and I will tell them to the best of my ability. All of them are deeply rooted in Hawaiian culture and spiritual beliefs, so please read this with an open mind. If you are not Kanaka Maoli. I have contemplated whether it was right to share this, but I find that this is my opportunity to share her with the world. She has had many experiences in her lifetime, which I have been gathering from my family members but these are stories that I have had the honor to experience. I'll do my best to keep them short. Story number one, a fireball visits our home. In the year 1991, when I was just five years old, an akualele, or fireball, visited our home. Being so young at the time, I can only remember bits and pieces, but they have been validated by other family members who were there that night. My tutu and I were sitting in the living room watching television. This also served as her bedroom. There were beds all over the house, as from time to time, relatives would come to stay or sleep for the night. One of those dial switch TVs with only seven channels was our television. My older cousin was in his bedroom, which was near the living room. All of a sudden, I heard my cousin yelling for my grandma. He runs into the living room. Toot, what is that? He points out the window, which was just behind the TV. I sat up and went to the window and peeked in between the jalouses. What I saw, I could never forget. A ball of fire was moving above the mango trees in our backyard. It was literally gliding over the trees and toward the windows. I remember how bright it was. It had a long black tail trailing behind it, with sparks of red flickering around it. 
It was big and it was loud. I have never seen something like this before. I thought it had come from the sky. As it got closer, I felt the hands of my grandma wrap around my chest as she pulled me away from the window. Her voice was filled with raspiness and she shouts, Akualele. She yells to my cousin, grab the salt, go now. My cousin runs to the kitchen and grabs a big bag of Hawaiian salt and begins throwing it out of the bag. I remember feeling the big rocks hitting the back of my legs. I slid behind my grandma as the fireball began ducking back and forth between the two windows, as if it was trying to get a look at us. The next thing I remember is her cursing at the thing in Hawaiian. She shouts louder and louder and louder until the thing stops and explodes right in front of my eyes. It was just one loud pop and then it was gone. Years later, as my cousin and I were recalling the story, he explains to me that the Akualele was sent to us from another Hawaiian family who lived farther down the road. The grandmother of their family was jealous of my grandmother as we had recently obtained more land to expand our coffee farm. What I didn't remember was that I fell deathly ill for the next two days, and my grandmother only left my side once to go talk to the family so they could come to an agreement. After giving offerings and sharing each other's breath, she returned home to find her granddaughter alive and well, as if I had never been sick at all. Story number two, the Aumakua that saved my uncle. This happened in the year 1995, when I was just nine years old. The best thing about where I lived, which was in Captain Cook, South Kona, was that many of my family lived on the same road. I had a girl cousin who lived a five minute walk from our home, past my uncle and auntie's house and through a grove of banana trees and thick elephant grass. Yeah, ouch. I would spend the night there a lot. She was like my best friend. One night, I arrived there as the sun was going down. She was outside on her front porch, crying. Her sister was draped over her body, and they were consoling each other over something. I ran up to her and asked what was wrong. She says, it's my dad, he's sick. I went up the stairs and was about to enter the living room when my aunt peeked her head out of the bedroom door, warning me to stay outside. I began to cry, as any child my age would do in an unknown situation like that. I asked what was wrong, but could already hear the moans and wails coming out of my uncle's lips. His father was a Filipino man, and he was sitting on his usual rocking chair, this time holding a bowl in his two hands, hovering over it, examining it. I went to him to examine it myself. As I passed the walkway into the living room, I peeked into my uncle's room. My auntie was wringing out a towel over his head. The bed sheets were covered in his sweat. He wasn't moving, and he was barely breathing. His father was holding a bowl of water. In the bottom of the bowl was a thin layer of raw white rice. He points to the two flecks of rice floating at the top of the water. Oh no, no good, no can help my boy, he says in his constant broken English. He looks up to finally notice that I was there. He grabs my arm tightly as if to show me that I need to listen now with the utmost importance. Go to your tutu, bring her now. My boy going make. I ran back to our house and I remember the feeling of my lungs just ripping out of my chest. I ran into the living room and called out to my grandma, Tutu, come, it's Uncle Dickie, which was short for Richard. I ran back outside as my grandmother got up. She took a machete and chopped down a bundle of tea leaves. My grandmother starts up the work truck and we take off toward my cousin's house. My grandmother goes into the living room. My Filipino uncle stays silent. I remember sitting outside with my cousins trying to console them in their grief. We sat on the side of the porch, our legs dangling between the railings. 
I could hear my uncle muttering in tongues as my grandmother prayed for Almakua to come. Almakua stands for spiritual guardian, which are usually manifested into animals. Every person of Hawaiian descent knows which Almakua relates to their bloodline, and I'm sure many have a story to tell of when they have come to provide aid. Yes, it's true, and it would become true to me now. As we were wiping the tears from our eyes, just a moment to breathe back the sobs, I heard a screech. In front of her house was the unpaved road. There was just one street light over the telephone wires running down the side of the road. I looked toward the direction of the screech and could see a small shadow flying toward the telephone wires. I tapped on my cousin's shoulder and begged her to look. It was a Hawaiian owl, a pueo. It perched up on the wire and just looked at us. All three of us were caught in a trance and a feeling of calm swept over me. That's when another one came and perched right beside the first one. Well, that's odd. They spend their lives in solitude. Maybe they were a pair. Just as soon as the second one came, there came another and then another, two sets of two. What a sight to see, I thought. In the midst of what was happening at the moment, we found happiness. My cousin begins to giggle a little as she gets up to tell her mom what was happening. Just as soon as she gets up to turn around, she lets out a small sigh. We look up to see that her head had bumped into her father's chest. He holds his daughter in his arms as she begins to scream. Baby, what is it? What are you all staring at? We stared at him, our eyes as big as a mempachi fish. As we turned around to look back at the telephone wire, the owls were gone. My uncle says to us, don't worry, I saw them too. But how? Just a half an hour ago, we thought he was doomed for death. He tells his family, I saw them in my dream, up there on the telephone wire, yeah? I look deep into the eyes of one and that's when I woke up. What is it? Why are you all staring at me? Story number three, my grandmother's funeral. I apologize in advance for bringing out two great stories just to hit you with the inevitable fact that my grandmother's life came to an end. It was the biggest tragedy in my life, and for some reason, I can't come to grips with it. Maybe it's because she's still with me. She was the caretaker and kahuna figure of my family, and that didn't end in her death, if that makes you feel any better. Or maybe it confuses you. Well, it was the year 1999 in the month of March when my tutu had passed. My grandfather had died just two months earlier. She died of a broken heart, no reason to live anymore. Her funeral service was held at our local church in Kealakekua. I spent the whole time next to her open coffin, just waiting for her to move, to say something. Please wake up, Tutu. I still need you, I say. The church was packed to the ceiling. So many relatives, so many friends. She meant everything to everyone. The only one I noticed that wasn't there was my uncle, my father's brother. It was just the two of them with a string of Hanai, or adopted brothers and sisters who would carry out the coffin at the end of the ceremony. We were trapped in eternity during the service, but I begged it not to stop. The casket was finally closed and all the Hawaiian aunts and uncles wept, as it was custom to cry loud enough for the heavens to hear. The men in the family all took their places at the coffin and lifted my grandmother off the frame, all with one spot left vacant. They walked down the small stairs and through the short walkway to the hearse. My father was at the back. My mother, sister, brother, and I were right behind at the front of the line. As soon as his foot left the sacred area of the chapel, I saw my uncles buckle as they dropped the coffin to the ground. They began looking at each other, finding a time to laugh, saying, come on, brah, no get weak on me now. They stooped back down to pick the coffin up. I literally watched five of the strongest men in my entire family struggling to pick my grandmother up. 
cries and whispers start floating around the chapel as they attempt over and over to raise her coffin off the ground. It would not move. They could not move her. My father explained that the coffin was heavier than blue rock. My father and my uncle lean down at the front of the coffin and peek open the door that was to be forever closed. I could hear my father talking to his mother. Ma, it's time to go. What are you waiting for? As they continued pleading with my dead grandmother, I heard the rumbling of an engine racing up the driveway of the church. It was my uncle, late as usual, even to his own mother's funeral. Real Hawaiian time, as we would say. He puts on his white gloves and kneels in front of the pastor, apologizing for his tardiness. Why he was late, I don't know. But as he took his place at the coffin, across from my father, they lifted the coffin once again. My grandmother's coffin floated off the ground, light as a feather, they said. They walked another 15 steps or so to the hearse. They said it was like my grandmother floated to the car. Even in her death, she was still as strong as ever, refusing to leave this world without her two boys by her side to lead her to the next. Story number four. Grandmother and grandfather hear my father's plea for help. Yes, there is a story number four. How, you may ask? As I said before, her guardianship does not end in her death. How comforting, yeah? This took place two years after my grandparents had passed. This one involves my father and mother, and every time he tells the story, the facts never change. My parents had gone to Hilo for the weekend, on the other side of the island. We have family in Keakaha that they would visit from time to time. Now, geez, that's another chapter right there. But anyway, my father and mother decide to spend the night at Hilo Seaside Hotel, right down the road. My father himself, being half Hawaiian and half Filipino, always had a sixth sense. And sometimes it was a nightmare as it started that way that night. It was around 2.30 in the morning and they were sleeping in room number 102, queen size bed. The room was small and the door to the room was real close to the bed. If you open the door and walk to the right, it leads you down a flight of stairs, across a small garden area, through a swinging gate and into the parking lot. My father was being visited once again by a choking ghost. This has happened to him on many occasions in his life, but as he tells me to this day, it was one of his last encounters. As the clock reads 2.36 a.m., he is woken up by a feeling of fear in the pit of his stomach. He could see a shadow forming at the foot of the door. The shadow leaks under the crack of the door and up the door onto the ceiling. He began rubbing his eyes to adjust to the darkness, the tint of yellow light coming through the sliding glass door on the other side of the bed. My mother was sound asleep. He thought for a second of waking her. As he looked closer and closer at the shadow, it began to take the shape of a womanly form. Only now the shape was that of a gecko crawling on the wall, the arms and legs bent out and away from the center of the body. He was disgusted as this thing begins crawling on the ceiling, making its way above the bed. As soon as it is hovering over my father, it drops from the ceiling and lands on his chest. This womanly creature had a face, he said, a horrible face with a slithering tongue. It wraps its legs around my father's stomach and the hands grasp his arms, holding him down on the bed. He was frozen in fear as he attempted to wake my mother from her sleep. My mother is of Caucasian descent, so she was usually not as affected by these things as my father was. The womanly creature stares directly into his eyes. He says it was just grinning at him as he began to feel his throat tighten and his esophagus lock up. He was gasping for breath as he tried his best to get this thing off. The creature began shrieking as he was slipping in and out of consciousness. He said he felt as if he was taking his last breath when all of a sudden the door swings open. There was another shadow standing inside the frame of the door. As it walked into the room, the yellow light hit the face, the face of my grandmother. 
He hears his mother shout, Aole mamake, you cannot have my son. She begins cursing at the thing. Even though the thing was still on my father's chest, he was bewildered at the fact that his dead mother was standing in front of him, as if her flesh were still real. There was a bright light coming from behind her. As my grandmother continued to curse and curse at the thing in Hawaiian, it finally let off and scampered off, dissipating into the sliding glass door. My father could not take his eyes off his mother, but she doesn't say a word to him, just stares at him for a few seconds smiling. She turns around and walks out of the room and out the door of their hotel room. This is when my mother wakes up. Even if you were to put my parents into separate rooms, they would still recall the same story. My mother joins my father at the door, asking him what's going on. My dad was staring down the corridor where the stairs were. That's when my mother's eyes focused on my grandmother, who was still walking. She walked down the steps and past the garden. She looked as alive as ever. No more limping, no more pain as she walked. She walks out the swinging gate into the parking lot. That's when they realized that she was walking to a parked car at the corner, facing out toward the front street of the hotel. The brake lights were glowing red, but he could make out the blue bumper of his father's 62 Mazda. In the reflection of the rear view mirror, he could see his father's face. He was right there, sitting in the driver's seat of the car. They watched as my grandmother approached the car, saying to him, Okay, Papa, we go now. Our boy is okay. She gets into the passenger seat. They remember watching the glowing of the brake lights as the car disappeared into the darkness. So, there you have it. I hope this gave you an ounce of insight into the wonderful woman that my grandmother is. And for you, Kanaka Maoli, an insight into the wonderful people that all of our Tutuhine and Tutukane are. And if you still have the fortune of having them here in this world right now, don't take another second for granted. Because with them, they take our past, our tradition, and our inherent right to be proud of who we are. Please take this chance to ask them as much as you can, jot it down, and share it with the rest of the world before it's gone. I've witnessed paranormal activity since the age of seven. I'm 26 now, and I experience this activity wherever I go. It started with my sister and a group of her friends playing with a Ouija board when we were younger. My sister and her friends were between the ages of 10 and 12. I was seven. My grandmother told me that because I was the youngest and the most innocent of the group, something latched on to me. I have many stories to tell, but I'll tell some of the shorter stories now. My mom saw a black figure which looked like a person, crawling on all fours with dislocated joints coming down the hallway, wearing one of my Halloween masks. When my mom turned to face it, it disappeared. She screamed my name, thinking it was me trying to scare her, but that's when she saw that I poked my head out of the day room. Her face completely lost color. She had me go into my room and dig out the Halloween mask. It was a skull faceplate with horns around the top. She said that the figure was wearing it and that she wanted it out of the house. On three separate occasions, my grandmother had woken up to a little boy wearing an early 19th century sailor suit when she looked closely at him. She could see that his skin was pale and it was dark blue and black around his eyes and lips. Another time, I was playing with my dog by throwing a blanket over my head, and he would pull the blanket off. My dog started to whimper and cry, and before I could take the blanket off to see what was wrong, I heard a deep, raspy male's voice breathe heavily in my ear and then exhale. My dog then proceeded to freak out and bark. I could probably write a thick chapter book with all the things that I have seen, but 
Hopefully these stories interest you. On my mother's side, there was a story that's been told since I was a kid. It was even told before me to my older siblings, my cousins, and even my younger aunts and uncles. It is somewhat of a ghost story, but as some family stories go, the times and details get muddy. When the story was first told to me, it took place in the early 1920s, and here is how it goes. A family member, it varied from great-grandmother to great-grand-aunt. Well, she was a little kid, and her family was traveling and decided to pull over and picnic and camp for the night. I always assumed they were part of the Dust Bowl movement, because the story was as they were heading to California. The story goes that during the night, the little girl, my great-grandmother or great-grand-aunt, hears screaming and yelling she runs and hides and looks out from behind a tree, and she witnesses her entire family being axed to death. The lore was that if you went to the site and camped there, you could still hear their screams and that nobody ever caught the killer. Fast forward to a couple of years ago through Ancestry.com and researching my family history, I confirmed with a great uncle the truth of our family story. My great-great-grandmother was a survivor of the Apache Massacre in New Mexico. I ended up visiting the site, and there's a wiki page about the 1861 massacre where they attacked settlers that were on their way to California. My family's wagon train was crossing the area, and my great-great-grandmother's family were all killed. She was the only survivor from the family and ended up being adopted by a local family. Our family name was lost as she was so small she didn't remember it. The story was that her mother hid her so she wouldn't be killed. She was later found by a garrison militia in the area and turned over to the Catholic Church nearby. One night, an uncle of mine was walking home. The sun was just starting to set, and in Lagos at the time, there weren't many street lights. So when it got dark out, it got dark out. My uncle had been told by my abu, my dad's mom, many times not to stay out too late and to always be home before the sun goes down. My uncle was a very stubborn person when he was younger, according to my dad, and always blew off everything that my abu would say. On this night, he definitely should have listened to her, and if I'm not mistaken, he did after these events happened. As he was out walking, he saw a man standing on a street corner. The man looked at my uncle and said, You should get home, kid. It's getting late. My uncle, being the jackass he was, said, Screw you, old man. Don't tell me what to do, and went about his leisurely walk home. After a couple of blocks, my uncle saw the same man standing on a different street corner. The man said the same thing as he did before. My uncle didn't think much of it and told him to go F himself and continued walking. After a few blocks, my uncle saw the same man yet again, but this time he had a big snarling dog with him. The old man said the same thing, this time with the dog growling and baring its teeth. My uncle was a little more bothered this time, understandably so, but still told the old man to shove it and kept walking. He was nearly home at this point, the sun was gone, the moon bright in the sky, and then he sees him again, and this time he's just laughing, maniacally. Not only is he laughing, but he has two dogs now. According to my dad, my uncle said that the dog's and man's eyes were red, and as soon as my uncle walked past them, he heard the man let the dogs go. He took off running as fast as he possibly could, the dogs barking, snarling, and giving chase. As soon as my uncle reached my abu's house, he started pounding on the door furiously, begging her to open up. 
Once the door was opened, he flew inside and told her to shut it fast. My abu was trying to figure out what was happening, and my uncle told her about the man and the dogs. My abu said that he was being ridiculous and that there was nothing out there. She opened the door and saw nothing but my uncle swore that he could see the dogs pacing outside back and forth, teeth sharp, eyes red, fur black, and waiting for him. My grandma is from Olancho, Honduras. In the old days, the only way to reach her area was through plane because there were no roads and it was very unsafe to travel by car. At the time, my grandma was fighting for my grandfather's love with another woman. Of course, my grandmother won and had four kids and many grandchildren. Remember this. Fast forward and I'm 14 years old staying at my grandmother's apartment. The reason being, we were going to drive to Florida. It was going to be me, my little brother, my mother, my aunt, and her friend. But I was staying at my grandmother's until we left in the morning. I was sleeping in the living room. I had to go to the bathroom, so I put my pants on. With that mission accomplished, I looked for the light switch on the exit door of the apartment. For some reason, I couldn't see it, even though it wasn't dark at all. The living room was just dimly lit. You could see everything in perfect clarity, but for some reason, there was no switch. So I turned my head toward the left, where there was a hallway toward the bathroom. I walked toward the switch, but before I do, I see a black figure. Not a shadow, but a completely black hooded figure, just standing there. I was thinking that my eyes were just adjusting after waking up, so I walked toward the switch, but as soon as I did, the figure walked toward me. I got scared and walked faster toward the switch, and the figure began to walk faster as well. I thought that if I turned on the light, it would go away, so I get to the switch and turn it on. The figure was in my face for a split second after I turned the lights on. I didn't say anything to anybody because I just knew that nobody would believe me. Fast forward to the next day on the road to Florida. We all played songs and told stories, and one story that my aunt told us revealed everything. Apparently, she met with a palm reader from El Salvador. She said that the palm reader told her her future and something from our family's past. Apparently, when my grandmother was fighting with the other woman to win my grandfather's love, the other woman went to her mother who happened to be a voodoo priestess and put a curse on my family. She went on to repeat what the woman had told her about the curse. Quote, your family will be haunted by a voodoo god. It is a black figure with no face. It will not harm you, but it will let you know that it's there. I freaked out. I said BS and I told her to tell me she was lying. Then I told them what I had seen the night before. The rest of the drive was pretty quiet after that. A couple of years after this, my brother saw the same figure on my bed. But that's another story for another day. I grew up in a house that was built in 1902. I was born in the late 80s, so the house had been remodeled a few times. It was a two-story house with three bedrooms and a tiny bathroom on the second floor. The bathroom was at the top of the stairs, and my room was across the hall at kind of an angle. My sister and my parents had rooms farther down a long, narrow hallway. For as long as I can remember, I saw a ghost. I called her Pam. My mom told me that I began talking about Pam around the age of five and that I never stopped. My mom never believed any of this and just brushed it off as my wild imagination. Pam was pink and transparent, a see-through, totally pink little girl, maybe eight or nine years old. 
She knew that I could see her, and I knew that she could see me. But she never made a sound, ever, nothing. She walked around only the upstairs and never came down the steps. Honestly, I have no idea where the name Pam came from. Growing up, Pam would sit at the top of the stairs, waiting for me to run up to the bathroom after I got home from school. I would walk around her because she was always there, every day. If she wasn't sitting on the step, she would just be sitting on a bed or standing in one of the rooms or the hallway, harmless for the most part. However, if I ignored her, she would mess up my bedroom while I was gone doing my paper route. When I would get back home, my parents would be all sorts of angry over my messy room. But if I just said a quick hi, she wouldn't mess with me. She never touched me. And I also never physically saw her move anything with my own eyes. But I would get really scared and nauseous every time she would destroy my room behind my back. So I learned very quickly to say hi to her every day. At the age of 15, my mom put me into therapy because I was still bringing up Pam here and there. Pam was still always around. I was used to her and she wasn't doing anything. So she didn't come up in conversations as often. Therapy helped, but not with Pam. When I was 17, my parents decided to put our house up for sale. I don't know if it was all the people walking through or me packing up my stuff but something triggered Pam and it got real crazy. About a month before our new house was built and ready to be moved into, I was asleep in my room. My bed was against the wall and I could lie on my side and see right into the bathroom. While asleep, I had a dream of Pam, still transparent, standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She pointed up and for the first time in my life, I heard her talk. She said, look, that's my mom. I sat up in bed and from the light fixture saw a dark haired woman hanging lifelessly by a rope. Her boot fell off of her foot and hit the floor and I woke up. Holy crap. I couldn't say anything because my family never saw her. They didn't understand. Pam wasn't in their lives like she was in mine. I didn't really dwell too much on it. It was a dream, right? Pam was back to sitting on the top step the next day, life as usual. But two weeks later, I had another dream. It started out exactly like the first one. The bathroom light was on and I could kind of see into it while laying down on the bed. But this time I heard a weird grunting and splashing. I sat up and saw clear as day the woman that had been hanging from the light fixture was not only alive, but was holding Pam, no longer translucent, under the water in our bathtub. She was drowning Pam in our bathtub. I don't have any idea what made me wake up, but I could not contain my emotion. I ran down the hall and jumped into my parents' bed as a 17 year old. It was just my mom in there. I think my dad fell asleep on the couch or something, but I was hysterical. I told my mom everything through tears and gasps for air. My mom didn't know what to say. Then in the middle of my sadness, Pam walked into the door frame of my parents' bedroom. She was transparent again. I quickly laid down really close to my mom and pulled the covers over my head. I just remember saying, Oh my gosh, mom, she's in here. I held my breath and seconds later, I felt cold, small hands on my back, shoving me against my mom. I kept yelling, stop touching me. My mom could only reply with, I'm not touching you. This went on for what felt like forever, but was probably only a matter of seconds. When she stopped, she just stood there at the side of the bed, staring at me. She didn't move. I pulled the covers over my head again, and I ended up crying myself to sleep while my mom held me. We were both shaking horribly. I moved all of my stuff out the next day, and I slept on the floor of our unfinished house the next few nights until my bedroom was done. I never went back. Shortly after my family moved out completely, and before the next buyers moved in, 
The entire back of the house and the entire garage went up in flames. The official cause was listed as spontaneous combustion. The first people to buy and sell the house after us lasted 10 months there. They called my parents to tell them that they couldn't keep the window or closet door shut in the room with the black carpeting. That was my bedroom. I saw the house posted a couple of months ago on Zillow, and the only picture of my room shows the door open a crack. You can see a bit of the black carpeting, but there's nothing in the room. The rest of the house is furnished. I've tried so hard to find any information about the girl that's in my old house, but there's almost no information at all, just basic architecture and lot line documents. It's the craziest story, but this was my childhood. Part of me feels sorry for Pam, but another part of me knows that there's something strong and dark in that house. I know Pam loved me in a way, but there's no way I would ever go back. This occurred over 20 years ago, but it's still fresh on my mind. My son was born early. We were lucky, and he had a few issues, but we were able to bring him home a month after he was born. He came home on oxygen and caffeine due to bradycardia. Once we were home, strange things began to happen. The cat refused to go into his room. And before he was born, I was forever removing said cat from this room. Our dog would sit at the bottom of the stairs and tilt his head as if he was listening to something. I would be changing his diaper and start talking as I thought his dad had just come into the room, only to turn and find out that I was alone. A friend gave him a peekaboo big bird toy that would say peekaboo when you covered and then uncovered its eyes. This toy would go off all the time, even after I put it into a box in the closet. I often felt that I was not alone in that house. My parents had given us an angel care baby monitor as a gift. This had a pad that was placed under the mattress and an alarm would sound if it didn't detect any movement after a certain amount of time. As our son was tiny, only five pounds when he came home, this alarm would go off often. I would wake up, walk into his room, turn it off and check on him. He was always fine, and I never felt that it was anything but the fact that he was so little that the pad didn't pick up his breathing. During this time, I would often dream of a woman. I would find this woman in his room. I never saw her directly, but I would dream that I saw the shadow of a woman with long hair standing and reaching into his crib. The dreams never scared me, but I did find them very odd yet comforting at the same time. I can't remember how long he'd been home, but it was at least a month. He was still on oxygen and still on caffeine. Our bed was to the left of our bedroom door, and I slept on the right-hand side next to the door. My husband slept on the left-hand side. I was asleep and I was woken up by being shaken roughly. I woke up and looked over at my husband and I said, why are you shaking me? Only to realize he was completely asleep and he was on the wrong side from where I was shaken from. I immediately jumped up and ran into my son's room. I flipped the light on, something I had never done up until this point, and I heard a gasp from the crib. Often when babies spontaneously stop breathing, you just need to startle them and they will begin again. I truly believe that he had stopped breathing and my turning on the light startled him into breathing again. After this episode, the dreams and strange occurrences with the pets and toys continued, until my son came off of the oxygen and caffeine. Once that happened, the odd occurrences stopped. The pet stopped acting weird, and the Big Bird toy never went off on its own again. I believe that someone came home with him to keep him safe. The feeling I got from my dreams was that it was a young woman, maybe early to mid-twenties, I'll always be grateful for her watching over him and shaking me awake that night 
so that I could startle my son into breathing again. Back when I was in my late teens, I moved out of the house and out of town, and I rented a room from some couple. The woman didn't work, but her partner did, so she had lots of time on her hands, and she tried to control everything in the house, including me. I was working two jobs while studying. The woman, who literally had no life besides trying to mess up other people's lives, started doing a lot of weird things. I would wake up and find her watching me sleep. She stole my sunglasses, killed my fish, etc. She tried bossing me around and trolling me in real life. However, she would disappear every full moon to apparently get nude and dance with her coven in the mountains. She claimed to be a witch despite my interest in spirituality and tarot I actually don't believe in witches or witchcraft, but nonetheless she claimed to be one. I think the spells work on a belief system that causes a domino effect of either positive or negative things occurring. Either way, no matter. I decided I had had enough of tolerating her BS and I moved out. That resulted in her stalking me. She turned up twice to my workplaces, staring at me for hours. I reported her to the police. Then she tried to cyberstalk me via Facebook and phoning me a million times. After moving into a new place, I would wake up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. Yet whenever I got up or turned the light on, it disappeared. Hence, I assumed I was dreaming. Eventually, it started standing at the foot of my bed. But again, whenever I tried to get up or turn the light on, it would vanish. One night, I woke up to it standing there like usual, but I could see a creepy woman's face on it. It was smiling at me. I told it to F off, and it vanished. For a while, I didn't see the thing, but I started coming up with scratches all over my body. I had no idea where they were coming from. I would find them on my arms, my chest, my hips, my thighs. One night I woke up and ran to the bathroom mirror because I thought something had bit me. Instead, I found scratches on my shoulder and back, like somebody had just clawed me. I checked my bed for anything that could scratch me, and I even visited a doctor who just accused me of self-harm. I wasn't, and I couldn't figure out where these scratches were coming from. The last incident occurred one night when I was half asleep and rolled over onto my side. I felt air on my face. I originally ignored it, until I felt a big gust of air directly into my face. I opened my eyes to come face to face with this rotten, bloated, dead-looking woman. She looked wet, like someone had killed her and then left her in water to rot. Her body was coming out from underneath the bed while her head was propped up near my face. I actually screamed and I was too scared to get off the bed. So, like a little kid, I covered my face with a blanket and I started saying prayers and waited until morning. After that, it never came back and all the scratches healed. It scares me to think about, but I do wonder if it lived under my bed for a period of time and was somehow scratching me from underneath. As to where it came from, again, I don't believe in spells and whatever, but whatever it was wanted to pose as a female and I think it was part of my loser ex-housemate's nonsense. Like a malevolent manifestation of spite or something she had sent after me. I don't really know what it was, but I haven't seen it in a long time. So, as long as it stays that way, I guess it's all good.